and he would turn and say, now it says over here in Revelation 6, verse 27, it says this, and this word means this, and when you turn over to Revelation 19, verse 8, you compare the two, and you see what they mean? Doesn't that make sense? This is going to happen, and I'd be saying, yes, yes, it makes a lot of sense, and inside, internally, my mind would be saying, come. Huh? And again and again, that would be happening. And he would bring out paper and he'd draw these elaborate charts and he would say, now, this is the time when the probation is going to close and this is when the beast is going to arise and this is when Antichrist is going to come and this is when the tribulation is going to be gone, come and on and on and on and on and on. Now, looking back on it, I realized that most of what he said was just a bunch of hooey. I mean, he didn't it. it was a nice thing. But if you get into the Word and into the book, I mean, for the last, I think, 40 years, I've been wrestling with this book. And the more you study it, there is one thing that emerges out of its pages that becomes crystal clear. It's an amazing thing, and I want you to see it this morning. It's very clear from Revelation 1, verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not a revelation of the beast, the dragon, the mark of the beast, the harlot, the rapture, the tribulation. It's not a revelation of any of those things. It is a revelation of Him. And friends, more and more, as I've studied this book, I see Jesus. I remember it's a revelation and I'm very lonely, pulling aside the curtain so that we'll get a better picture of Jesus. That's what revelation means. I am very a revealing. And revelation is part of the battle. And do you realize that Jesus now, especially in our world, desperately needs to be revealed to this planet? I mean, you think of it. There are 7.3 billion people in this planet. Do you realize that only 32%, one less than one third of them, are Christian? Only one third. Do you realize that the majority of those majority of Christians are lost in legalism, ceremonialism, or ritualism, and there's no heart, love, experience going on? And for those that do have some kind of relationship with God, often they often they are denying that relationship by their actions, their worldliness, their apostasy. And you have to say, "Wow!" So Jesus desperately needs to be seen, but the Christians, most of them are out of love. And most, and then of course you have 23 percent of them are Muslim. 23 percent definitely of the world population are Muslim. And then you've got Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and all the other isms on top. And the majority of them look at Christianity as if it's a bunch of unbridled, misguided, misfocused lunatics who are also hypocrites. And you say, how is he going to be revealed? Well, friends, it's clear that he is the, himself is the revelation. Are you aware of that? Come with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. The Gospel of Luke chapter 2 is one other place in Scripture where the actual word apocalypsis, revelation, is used. That word, when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, the root word is apocalypse, apocalyptic. You've heard it before. Just like it's found, just like it's written in the Greek. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Jesus is a young baby. His parents bring him to the temple. They bring him to the temple. I think he's a month and a half old to be. Well, whatever it needs to be done in one year is a month and a half old. There's a bunch of ceremonies. And it says in chapter 2, verse 
22, when the days of her pure purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem. To leave Bethlehem, they traveled as, what, 15 miles northward to Jerusalem to present it to the Lord as, as it is written in the law of the Lord. And guess what? They show up on the temple mount there in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden they're greeted by an elderly man. Because verse 25 says, Luke 2 25 says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, righteous man, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost is upon him, which man is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. And under the influence of the Holy Spirit, verse 27, he is led to the Temple Mount. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he, Simeon, went up to these two parents, these cousins, and said, Can I see your baby? The priest could have cared less. The Levite didn't even notice him. He was incognito. Nobody recognized him. But this man was so enamored, filled by the Spirit, and you see what he said? In verse 28, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now I can die. Verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. In the baby, which you have prepared before the face of all people, and then he makes these words about this little baby. He says, this little baby is a what? A light. A light. The word is close for spoken, spoken graphic, soft correction, close to light to. Do you know what that is? It's apocalyptic. Literally, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Nobody else recognizing the priests don't, the Levites don't, the mingling crowds don't, but there is one man under the Spirit who clearly recognizes that this little baby in the arms of this peasant woman is none other than the revelation to the entire world. You can't be saying if you've got a lucky trip for me to notice that there is a comparison between light and glory. Just put this in your mind as a reminder. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good work and do what? Glorify light in our lives. We reveal good work, resulting in glorifying God. And then 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory. Again, there's that word glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So again, light and glory are put together. They equate it. The question that I have now is, how if the book of Revelation says that that book is that is Jesus revealed and veiled before the time, how is it that Jesus is going to be revealed? revealed? Is Jesus already, has he already been revealed to the time? In there's 7.4 million, 3 million, do they already know who Jesus is? All of them. Have they seen him clearly? The answer is no. So the question is, how is that going to happen? How is he going to reveal himself? So I want you to come with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. This is Jesus' last night on earth, before the crucifixion, and he clearly tells us how it is that he will be revealed. The, the supper in the upper room is ended, and Jesus lifts up his hands after teaching, 
And as we pray for prayer, I want you to hear the prayer. Verse 4. Father, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work that you've given me. Jesus said, Father, I've glorified you. Do you know what it means to glorify somebody? Jesus is saying, Father, I've taken the spotlight and I've focused it on you. I've never been in the spotlight before. Mm-hmm. We had an evangelistic series in a very, very dark church in Bakersfield, and we went down to Home Depot and bought a bunch of these big lights, you know. And so I got up in front, and every, all of us were blinded. They put the spotlight out there, an old rusty spotlight in the bathroom. They focused that on me, and I'm just trying to do this the whole time, you know. Very awkward. But for one reason, because when my lips moved and when I Priests so say people wanted to be able to see them and have that connection. Imagine listening to somebody you can't see. And to glorify somebody is to focus the light on them so they're revealed. And that's what Jesus did. And continuing on, in verse number 6, Jesus says, I've manifested your name unto the men that you've given me. What men had God given to Jesus? Who are they? The disciples. In verse 9, Jesus said, I pray for them, the disciples, not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for them of their yours, Father. Oh, the Father, in verse 10, yet they're mine, but my disciples are your disciples, and your disciples are mine. In verse 10, I am what? I am, Jesus says, I am glorified in thee. Who are they? The disciples. So what are the disciples doing with regard to Jesus? They're glorifying Jesus. They're shining the light on Jesus. Making Him look good. Revealing Him. And first I want you to hear something. When God wants to touch human beings' hearts, does He usually send an angel down from heaven, down to earth, to show up and say, here, let me tell you about Jesus. Is that normally how He does it? Does He even send people who lose in vision? Does He do that? Yes or no? Does He send somebody from another unfallen world to give them a special message of grace? Yes or no? Who does He send? He sends human beings, faulty, defective, sinful, often failing human beings like us. And He entrusts us with this incredible treasure that we have, the American vessel. And he says, you are to be the one to focus the spotlight on me and reveal me before the world. Are you seeing that? When God wants to reveal Jesus to the world, he uses human beings. This is why, from the beginning of the world, we've always had a people. Are you aware of that? Always had a people. Adam and Eve were his people. Then you have Seth, who started the godly line, resulting in Noah. Noah went into that ark and came out with just a total of eight members to, re- to regenerate the human race. And this was God's people. One of their great, 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 great grandsons was a man by the name of Abraham. They called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, I want you to go to a place you've never seen before, and there are no Google Maps to get you there. And I want you to start a great nation. And so the vast majority of his life, he's childless. And then he's given one son who's named as Isaac. And Isaac becomes the father of Jacob, and Jacob has 12 boys who become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel who come out of Egypt with God's mighty power. And you know what God does? He leaves them out of Egypt and puts them in the very center of the then known world in Palestine, the center of all the trade routes and crossroads where merchants and soldiers and businessmen of all ages would meet there and they'd be able to get a picture of who God really was. Now, for God's people, did they, were they effective in revealing Jesus to the world yesterday? I said, were they, were they effective? No, depends on which way you were. 
The bottom line is that they were not effective, they were defective. They were not formed. And when Jesus came, it seemed like people had lost almost all sight of Jesus. But Jesus raised up 12 men. He commissioned them. He poured out the Spirit on them. And the Gospel went to the entire world, the known world, and a single generation just like that under the influence of the Spirit. And today, God still has people on this world. And He wants to use them. And guess what? A number of them are in house for this very day. And they're sitting on pink shoes, or whatever you call this color. And do you know what? Why God has them? Because He wants the rest of this city and the rest of this world to see Him. Because you know what? When they're hurting, Jesus doesn't physically come and put his own arms around them. He sends you. Yeah. So when they need somebody to listen to them, Jesus doesn't say, hey, here, tell me. He sends you. And you are the only Jesus that many people will ever see. Yeah. So how is Jesus revealed? Yeah. To us, to us, to us. And guess what? If you see in the book of Revelation, get Revelation 1, verse 1. Make sure we're in Revelation 1, verse 1, by the way, because we're going to move on from there. In Revelation 1, verse 1, it's a revelation of who? It's a revelation of Jesus. And if you see it's a revelation of Jesus, and you ask yourself, well, how is he going to be revealed? Then the book of Revelation must also talk about what? Oh, beautiful. It must also talk about what? It must also talk about. His people. Because if Jesus is going to be revealed, you have to have a people. And guess what? Do you know what, the, what you find in the book of Revelation? You find that Jesus has a people. Have you ever looked at the first three chapters of the book of Revelation? First three chapters will deal with the seven churches. Do you know what the seven churches represent? The history of God's people. The God's people from then to now. And by the way, some of you say, yeah, but those are the local little old churches back in Asia Minor. Are you going to tell me that there were only seven churches in Asia Minor that Paul had raised up in that vast territory? Only seven? Is that right? Yeah. There were many more, but why did Jesus choose just these seven and gave them a special message? You know why? Because he said, I'm going to use these seven to represent my complete church throughout time. And I'm going to give them a message that will last to the second time. So the first several chapters, the first several uh, chapters, one, two, and three, are about God's people, and then you come to 144,000, which is meant to be more than a symbol of God's people. And then you come to chapter 12, and the woman is clothed with life. And what does the woman rep- represent in Scripture? Jeremiah 6, 2, I've likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and beautiful woman. Paul says in Corinthians, he says, I have found you and gave you as a faithful woman to Jesus. God's people are referred to as a woman. And then you come to chapter chapter 14, and guess what? You've got 144,000, a symbol of God's people. You come to chapter 15, God's people are shown as being in heaven, victorious, in the last couple chapters of the book, the home of God's people. Nine out of 22 chapters, over a third, almost a half of the book is devoted to showing us God's people and why? Because everyone who has been in the world for now is revealed in Jesus. Jesus is revealed in his people. And if we look at seeing Jesus through these passages, we see him leading the people out of the world to become mirrors that only reflect his glory as he leads them into eternity. And right from the word go in the book of Revelation, this theme is out of Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10. So I'm provided in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He said, well, really, I mean, he's having a vision. And I heard behind me a great voice, as the voice of a trumpet. And the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see right in the book contains in the seven churches. Verse 12. 
I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like under the Son of Man. So John sees seven candlesticks, and in the middle, he sees one like the Son of Man. What does the Son of Man represent? Who is the Son of Man? It's the Son of Man. It is Jesus. So if you have a question about that, go down to verse 17. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me and said, Don't fear, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And I'm alive forevermore, and I have the key of the grave and of death. Now, who is that? There's no question. This is Jesus. And where is he standing? Wait for the candlestick. Now, tell me, if you are a Jew, and John is a Jew, and you see a being standing in the middle of a candlestick, what would you immediately think of when you see candlestick? One. Because you have a seven-branch candlestick in the Old Testament sanctuary, and you have candlestick in the New Testament sanctuary. Yes, you do. You most certainly do. So you are immediately associated with that. And... Remember, there was a world that did not have incandescent or fluorescent or LED lighting. It was lit only by fire. And what how the center was lit if they had these lamp stands initially a kind of lighter of seven and one, and there were little bowls of oil, but you can't just simply take a big lighter and put oil on the fire. I mean, because it's not really efficient. You take a wick and you put it in there. It wick the oil and you take the wick and you put it in there. And in Solomon's time, of course, these became separate candlesticks, not just the seven cluster, but seven, but separate ones. First Kings 7, 49, the Bible says. And in this process, the oil is wicked up through the wick to the flame. And by the way, do you know what these candlesticks represent? You don't have to go to the newspaper. You don't have to turn on some religious broadcast and faith. You don't have to go to some church to hear about this. You can go right to the Bible. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 20. The Bible tells you exactly. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in your right hand are the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the candlesticks which you saw... They are the seven churches. So when you see Jesus standing in the middle of candlesticks, what would you, how would you interpret that? Jesus is really standing in the midst of his church. His church is, you and I make up the church. His church is represented by vessels that have the wick taking the oil, an oil symbol of the Holy Spirit, a conduit for the Spirit that comes up into the light and results in light to the world. Now, if you're a Jew and you're seeing a person in proximity to these items in the sanctuary, because we've already established that these lampstands are part of the sanctuary, if you're a Jew and you see these items in the sanctuary, what would you assume about the person who stood here? You would assume that he was a what? You would assume that at the very least he could have been a Levite, probably was a priest. And is there anything in the New Testament that would tell you about the identity of Jesus and what role he assumed following his ascension and resurrection? What role did he assume? Yes. Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9. Our great high priest. So tell me, what would the priest be doing in the midst of the candlesticks. I want to think back to the sanctuary service. What would the priest be doing in the middle of candlesticks? Oh, yeah, he said that. He'd be filling up there, filling them with oil, making sure they have plenty of the Holy Spirit. By the way, do you know how the oil got to the light? you know what the light is, light represents? Could I have somebody read something? Matthew 5, verse 15. Just stand up and read it. 
Matthew 5, verse 16. We're going to find out what the light represents. Because many of you can say, well, Jesus is the light. Oh, but we remember, how is Jesus revealed as the light of the world? He's revealed through his people. Oh, and notice specifically, somebody with Matthew 5, verse 16. Can you read it out loud for us? If I make you like this, you open up I've never heard this translation. Which one is this? The message. Beautiful translation. I need it a little bit more literally. That was a beautiful prayer. Thank you. Somebody else who will have it more clearly, more succinct. Matthew 5, 15. Thank you, sister. Now, thank you so much. So when Jesus says, let your light shine before men, what will people practically be seeing? They'll be seeing light, but they'll not just be seeing light. They won't just see brilliance and glowing coming out of your skin. What will they be seeing? They'll be seeing who to them. Yes, you know, where have you been having beautiful understanding? They'll be seeing your good work. Understand that and help good work. Oh, but that's where Jesus comes in. Because you know what? I want you to hear this. I don't have any good work. Jesus says, let your life shine. So I just see your good work. But I don't have any good work. Do you know what part I play in it? I'm just the work. And do you know what that work was made out of? Some of you know. The unused, no longer usable, soiled, undergarment of the tree. A conduit for life. If that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what does. Jesus uses dirty, sinful human beings, if we will, to illuminate this world. Now, what else? Might Jesus be doing in proximity to these lamps if you're hearing the fact that you think that this is a priest standing by the lampstand? What else might he be doing? If you're seeing a priest and he's just filling them with oil, he's making sure they're lit. What else? Oh, you know what? We yes, have to make sure they have oil. Oh, I heard something. He said that. Yes, he's sitting there. And you know what? I'm bringing this up because most of us here, we live in an age which we don't even know about our own age. That's the wick that reaches down into the oil, that sucks it up. And what's the guy doing here? There's carbon that builds up on the wick. And the carbon hinders the light, hinders the flow of oil, and he cuts away that carbon and trims it. And by the way, are there any of you that need a little trimming? Maybe you've got some things that just hinder the flow of the oil. Maybe it's a bitter attitude. Maybe it's spirit, lack of love. And what is the high priest Jesus wanting to do with you? That lamp in front of him? So he wants to come and he wants to pray. It may be that quick temperament. That's the way to do it. That's the way. That constant worry. That constant comfort. And all for the purpose so that his people will shine more brightly. Now, I want you to hear this. Jesus is shown in chapter 1 and is in the middle of his people, right now. And all he works on each of the lamps that surround him, especially as it gets more dark. And we live in a dark time right now, amen? 
bad genes continue to turn into those lambs. And what will, what will happen to each of those lambs? When it turns them, they will what? They will burn more brightly. Yes, they will. And if they burn more brightly, what will somebody who stands far off notice? They'll notice light, but they're going to notice something else more clearly. Oh, you see as Jesus, yes, they will see Jesus more clearly. Because as he turns up, the light around him gets brighter and brighter, and other people say, Oh, that's Jesus. If that's what a Christian is, that's who I want to be. Wow. And guess what? When you come to Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, you see a woman. And what does the woman represent? She represents a church. And what do you notice about this woman? She stands on the moon, she's clothed with the sun, she's got stars in her hair. What do all the three of those have in common? Light. And here you have a woman that's clothed in light. This is what Jesus is lying in the air he's been put together. Light. Burning. You're not the light, I'm not the light. We're not the oil, all we are is the wick. And yet when it flows through us, Jesus is revealed and his work becomes visible. That reminds me of that little boy who crawled all over the floor with a bunch of crayons and pens and paper. His little sister comes up and stands, stands looking down on him and puts her hands on her hips and says, What are you drawing? He doesn't miss the beat. He says, It's not a what, it's a who. So then, who are you drawing? God. Well, how could you draw God? Nobody knows what he looks like. They know when I'm done. And when he is done, the world will know what Jesus has done. I was touched a number of times today in the afternoon. We had a special time. Somebody wanted to be baptized. Just simply a baptism. But I normally just do a baptism between those other things involved in, involved with it. And, Leading somebody into study and whatnot. But the third was moving, we thought it was appropriate, and we had this baptism. The coming of the baptism was a woman. A woman that I had seen only one time before, I think probably a year ago. And uh, remember, I think of this community or maybe another community. Anyway, as the province of God moved after the baptism, this woman needed. To share some things and some ministry, and a group of us gathered around her, and we listened and we prayed for her and prayed with her. And at the end, as things were winding down, it was obvious that the Spirit was present. So I'm deliberately making the details muddy because I don't want you to, I mean, I don't want to reveal any secrets to but I just want you to know it was a perfect time of ministry. God's chair was speaking to her heart and to ours as well. As it was coming to a close and after the closing prayer, somebody just said, Hey, what, what church do you apply to? And she said, Well, I actually don't go to any church. She said, But if there was one church I'd go to, it'd be your church. So that she said, I'd like to join this church. I think if you would accept me, would you accept me? And they kept looking at each other like, so, of course. And he went on, he said, because there's no other church, because if everybody, and she pointed to the lady that had invited her here, and she said, because if every one of your members is like her, then this church would be an amazing church to be something. Jesus wants to be revealed in his people. Father. The last thing that you share would powerfully rest upon our hearts. Father, our sinful, corrupt lives, self focus, sweep away those things that are our focus 
bring out the knife and the scissors and cut our wrists for the criminal. Allow the oil to flow because we want Jesus to be seen in His name. Amen.